you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. I want to talk about a sermon today that I've titled, Times of Trials, Challenges, and Sifting. Uh, the current events in the world today... It's, it's, it's just all over the chart. I spoke a, a good bit with Tick Mosley uh, before the service, and I spoke with Tiger Stokes the other day on the phone. And I think the racial relationships in the United States of America today, not in this church, but in the United States of America today, is stretched worse than it was than it was in the times I grew up in the 60s and 70s and for Tick. And, and, and you know, I learned a lot about, I, I was raised in a home where we went to Klan rallies and stuff, and, 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 and I learned that racism, I don't care what color you are, black, white, or neon green, doesn't make any difference. It's a learned trait. Somebody taught you that. You can take two little boys, a little white boy and a little black boy this big, and they don't know to hate each other until somebody teaches them that. And the events that are going on in the world today is just unbelievable. It's being promoted by the media. It's being promoted by the government. And, and it's, it's, it's just unbelievable. If, if you're a Christian, you have a bullseye on your back. You're being targeted. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through challenges. And, and you're going to be tested. You know, I, 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 um, I learned a lot from a guy by the name Richard Nodum, Terrence Wells, early on. And I learned a lot from, from Tiger. Tiger and I have been friends for a long time also. And when we first met, the second conversation we had was about Jesus. And uh, we was able to talk freely with each other, and I was able to learn a lot from him about the black race, and, and hopefully he was able to learn a lot from me about the white race. But isn't it awfully strange, though, that you have a pastor uh, that, that, that years ago had a vision that in South Mississippi, he could, he could put together a church that the Lord had given him the calling to put together a church that you could come and you could have racial harmony and be able to, to, to share each other's life and, and to uh, fellowship together. You know, <clears throat> I've been a Christian since 1983 and never, and I'm going to follow my notes a good bit today because I'm, I'm bad about getting off chasing rabbits and I think I got ADD, a ball, a robot or something and it just changes my whole train of thought. But... Uh, I've never seen God's people or God's Christian or, 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 you know, people of the Christian faith going through the trials that we're going through now. It seems like every home, every family, um, almost every individual is going through some type of trial. We're praying for one another because of trials, troubles, and affliction that's going on in our life. It's almost like Revelation 12 is coming to pass, it's coming to fruition where the, the devil, uh, where the word says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, the devil has come down having great wrath, <clears throat> knowing that his time is short. Naturally, we're Christians. We're going to go through times of testing and times of trials. There'll be times when your faith and your faithfulness is going to be uh, examined. It's going to be uh, proven. It's going to be stretched to where you, you believe it. You just can't take no more. If you're a Christian, you can look forward to that. The Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver you out of them all. And also it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there's no temptation taking you, but such is common unto man. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but with that temptation also make a wave and escape that you may be able to bear it. The fact is, trials, temptation, and sifting is, is an ordinary part of Christian life. Acts 14.22 says, The confirming of the souls, the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith that, ye, that we through much tribulation will enter into the kingdom of God. Much tribulation. Brothers and sisters, if you're being stretched right now, and you being challenged to a breaking point by, by a variety of trials and challenges and afflictions, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. It doesn't mean that you're in some type of grievous sin 
and this, this is the results of it. It doesn't mean that God's mad at you. What it really means is that you're a Christian. Can I tell you something? This is what the Bible said. Jesus said, I'm the, van, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Branches will be purged. Wheat will be sifted, will be whittled. Chick was, was reminding me this morning, I remember my mother and my grandmother taking flour, and they would put it in this little thing, and they would turn it. Any of y'all remember that? I know Mr. and Ms. Bradley does. You remember that? And they would get the lumps out of it. That's going to happen. Wheat is going to be whittled. Gold is going to be put to the fire, to the refiner's fire, and Christians are going to be tried. Uh, our faith is to be examined. Brother Harvey's an attorney here, and I'm going to use him for an example this morning. He, and, and, in fact, it's, it's a lot of pressure on me to do this up here. As mayor, I could speak, maybe because you didn't always have to tell the truth, I won't, but, but, but I could speak, but here you're under a lot of pressure. And uh, I text Brother Roger, I mean, uh, Brother Harvey, and I asked him, was he coming to church next Sunday? And he said, I, I said, I heard somebody else is preaching, and I generally only like to hear my own pastor preach. And I said, well, fine, and I'll talk about you all I want to. Well, he said, I'll be there. <laughs> but to add to the pressure, other than the time restraint, and then Brother Harvey texts me, and he said, if it's not good, he said, you will be injured. And uh, so that adds to the pressure because that's why I actually asked Tiger to come in, in, in case he need to help me usher out the building because <laughs> I didn't want Harvey to beat me up. But to go back <clears throat> to, go back to it, uh, what does it mean, a trial? If you go to court, you have a prosecuting attorney and you have a defense attorney. In this case, we'll say it, Brother Harvey's your defense attorney, God help you. But uh, what they're doing is the prosecutor presents his case and then Brother Harvey would de try to defend his case. He would present his case. And hopefully what they're trying to come to is the truth. You know, what, what is the truth of the whole matter? It, but really what it means to be on trial is to be examined, to be tried. The Bible tells us our faithfulness will be proved. It will be tested. It will be tried. It will be proven whether or not we stand, as we have re read in the Scriptures, through a little tribulation you shall enter the kingdom of God. Now it said through much tribulation, through much tribulation, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will deliver you out of all of them. Sometimes the tribulation is hot. First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing is happening to you. Sometimes the trials are fiery. Sometimes they're hot. And that just simply means they're intense. Trials can be of a long duration, but don't think it, it's some kind of strange thing happening to you. Why am I being singled out? Why is God picking on me? No strange thing is occurring. It's like some have said, hey, I'm one of the good guys. I go to church. You know, why is this happening to me? The fact is we all go through trials. We all go through tribulation. We all go through a sifting time. If you would, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. We're going to start at verse 31. <clears throat> and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as we. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And Peter said unto him, Lord, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go both to prison and to death with you. And Jesus told Peter, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou hast thrice denied that you know me. The rooster won't crow this day until you have denied me three times. I want to use this passage in particular as my text today to declare that these are the days of trials, challenges, and sifting. These are the days when the faith of many are being probed and tested and proven. Some will stand the test. Some will fall away and recover, and some will fall away and never come back. This is what sifting does. Sifting proves and reveals. This is a very interesting passage. It reminds me of uh, Job. It kind of pulls the curtains back a little bit and lets you look into the spirit world 
and uh, let you see some of the things that are going on around you that you're not even aware of. <clears throat> here's what Satan said. I mean, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Satan has desired to have you. Other versions translate that Jesus has begged to have you. He has pleaded to have you. Uh, if you read it in Williams or Beck's version, it says that Satan has prayed to have you. Satan prays. <clears throat> we'll talk about that in a minute. I want us to notice several things in these scriptures that I believe will encourage us. Jesus says Satan has desired to sift you. In the English language, in our language, the word you is always singular. Back then, we have words like you all, and of course, if you're blessed to be from the South, we have y'all. But uh, in the English language, I mean, in the language back then, you could have been singular or plural. In this case here, even though he's saying Simon, Simon, he's talking to all the disciples, and he's telling them, Satan has desired to have access to every one of you. If you profess to be a follower of Christ, Jesus, uh, Satan is praying to have you. That's all, that's all the joy he gets is to, is to get you and to drag you and as much as your family as he can to hell kicking and screaming. He desires to have you. Um, it's rather alarming that you know, it's, it's like the movie uh, Rocky. Roger and I both like the movie Rocky and, and, and some of you. Apollo Creed was dressed in the uh, Uncle Sam outfit, and he was saying, I want you, I want you, I want you. That's exactly what Satan is doing. He wants every one of you. He wants all of God's kids, anybody that proclaims that they're, they're, they're Jesus Christ is their Savior. <clears throat> and like I said, one version states that Satan has, has, has prayed for you. And it's rather startling to, to think that Satan prays. But <clears throat> that's some of what prayer is. He made a request. It's not all of what prayer is, but he made a request to, uh, to Jesus. He said, I want all of your disciples. But it's also comforting in the sense that Satan can't have his way with his own power. We are hedged in. We are preserved and protected by the Lord. Satan has to have divine permission to get to us, just like in the case of Job. This means that God sets the limit and the boundaries. You know, he, he, just, can't, he just can't run amok on you. Satan stated, Job doesn't serve you. Uh, he serves you because he's a mercenary. He serves you because he pay, it pays him. He serves him because you give him things. He has everything. That's why Job serves you. And so he challenges God in this. And, 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 and he said, if, if you let me get at him and you let me touch his stuff, you, you let me take his stuff and he'll curse you to your face. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really, and, and we know the story of Job, what happened with that. And it's really unsettling that the devil prays. He prays more than a lot of people that call themselves Christians do. He prays, he goes to church, he quotes the Bible. He misquotes it, but he quotes it. James says, you believe in God, you do well. So does the devil. You hear people tell you, I believe in God, so does the devil. Uh, I go to church, so does the devil. I pray, so does the devil. What makes us different? The devil doesn't serve the Lord. The devil serves himself, which is also what a lot of people do. The, the devil challenges God's people quite frequently. <clears throat> and people will serve God when it pays. But will you serve God when it cost is all. I seen this the other day on the internet, and I'm, I'm trying to get away from that Facebook stuff and all. I mean, I just stay too much on that, but, but I don't really, really care about half of what's being said and don't believe the other half. But I did see this picture on there, if they would draw it up, if they would bring that up. This is, this is a picture of us, and I want you to really think about this, consider this. This is a picture of us telling Jesus about how hard our life was. And, and, it, and it really makes you think, you know, at, the, at, at what he paid for us, and, but we're going to sit and tell him how hard our life was. And I, and I just thought I'd throw that up there for free. But true Christianity does cost. It also pays, but it does cost. It doesn't cost you a little bit. It costs you everything. 
It costs you your, 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 your dreams, your goals, your plans, your ambition. Every bit of that has to go to the cross when you become a Christian. It has to go through, 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 uh, through a different channel in your life now. It costs you some of your favorite habits. And when it costs you, we find out who stands and who falls. We find out what's precious in your sight. But I appreciate the fact here that Jesus gives his disciples a heads up on what's going on. He, he tells them Satan wants every one of you. He wants to destroy every one of you. He's, he's saying your disciples' faith is not real. They're hypocrites. They're pretenders. Just let me, just let me at them, and then we'll see. But the interesting thing, if we go back to Luke 22 and start at verse 24, what are the disciples doing? They're arguing over who's the greatest, who should be in first place. They, they arguing over, the, and we do the same thing. I can't get along with my brother-in-law because of what he said. I can't get along with the brother across the aisle because of what he said. We argue and fuss about the, the, the things that mean nothing. And I can't get along with him because he's that color. I can't get along with him because he's that color. I can't get along with him because he's a Democrat. I can't get along with him because he's a Republican. There's always a reason to draw a line and have a fight about something. <clears throat> you know, and, 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 and while we're quarreling over these things and who's the big dog, uh, Satan is, is, is asking for your soul. He's asking for you. He, like I said earlier, he wants you to drag you to hell. He wants you. So while we're going over this ridiculous stuff, that's what he's doing. You know, I think about the things that we pray for, hell, saving of souls, family members. Well, all this is important. It's the right thing to do. I also think about where I hear a lot of churches praying for uh, 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 new cars and, 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 and gold and houses and Rolls Royces and Mercedes and 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 and. and our, our jet's three years old now, and we need another eight million dollars to uh, get another one, and that's in, and, and you know, and I, I really have issues with that I was talking to uh, the pastor and Tick also about this. I couldn't, I couldn't be a pastor of a mega church. There's no way I can do that. There's no way your pastor could do that. I couldn't be a pastor of a mega church and live in the lap of luxury, and know that there's people in my congregation that don't know. How, if they can feed their children the next meal. But that's just me. That's just a, a thing that I have there. But, uh, you know, uh, we pray for that kind of stuff. And the devil, let me, let me assure you of this, the devil has no interest in planes, cars, automobiles, land, gold, or nothing. His interest is in your very soul. The, the devil longed to have Jesus' disciples, and that trickles down today. He wants all of God's kids. He wants every one of us. <clears throat> Read Luke 30, uh, 22, verse 31 again. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. You know, when Jesus used that, uses that double reference, you, you, you can hear the love and the compassion and the concern in his voice. That, 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 that he loves him so much. He loves those disciples so much. And like when he said, Martha, Martha, or when he said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, anytime he uses that double reference, you can, you can really see the heart of the Lord coming out. And, and you know, it's, it's because he knew what Peter was going to go through. He knows this as individuals. If you look in verse 32, now he's turned to Peter in particular here, and he said, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen your brothers. <clears throat> the Lord knows, knows you personally. He knows what you're going through in your family. He knows what you're going through in your home. He knows what you're going through on your job. He knows how you've been wronged. He knows, he knows everything about you. I heard a story later. I, I mean, uh, this week, uh, and I won't mention anything, I, and I, I won't mention the individual, but this guy was, was treated very wrong at his job. And my heart went out to him because I knew the guy. I knew, I knew what he stood for. But it's a persecution. It's a trial. It's, it's, it's a challenge to see if, if you will stand. He prays for us individually. 
If you read in Hebrews 7.25, this will bring you all the comfort you ever need in your Christian life. The last of that verse says, your Savior ever liveth to make intercession for you. He lived. He ever liveth just to pray for you. He prayed for Peter. He'll pray for you. He's no respecter of person. I want you to notice, though, with Peter what he didn't pray for. He did not pray that Peter would not be sifted. He did not pray that his faith would be stretched and tried, examined and proved. He didn't pray that. He didn't pray that Peter would, would be given an exempt or a pass from this. Peter was about to go through a trial of his faith, and the Lord was praying that Peter's faith would not die. Could it be that the Lord's prayer went unanswered? Let's examine that for a second. He denied the Lord three times, as the Lord said he would. He knew Peter was going to deny him. Why did he pray? Peter was going to fail. The fact of the matter is, the big difference between failing and failure, that's the whole difference in it. It's a difference between failing and just being a failure. I, I had the, the, the opportunity, and by the way, uh, Tiger Stokes is here today, but he was absolutely the greatest fighter ever from this state. He, I, I, I heard uh, Al Bernstein, which was the, the gospel of boxing back then, they, they asked him who was the most underrated fighter in, in the world today, and he said, that's easy. He said, a little kid from Moss Point, Mississippi named Donald Stokes. But, but, but I had the privilege of working with Tiger and getting to know him. And we, we went, I went with him to a fight in Davenport, Illinois. Uh, I, I remember the date was July the 3rd, 1902 or 1912 or something. It was a, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but I remember the date. And, and, and we went to that fight. And uh, Tiger was fighting a guy by the name of Keith Mullins. Keith Mullins was, had a record of 12 and 3, and Tiger was like... 38 and, and, and whatever, would, had more knockouts than he did fights. I mean, just a tremendous record. And um, uh, so Tiger was heavily favored in this fight. And, 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 and uh, the first round, Tiger broke his left hand. And he's a southpaw fighter. That was his power hand. He broke his left hand. And I could see him shaking his hand. And that was the third or fourth time the same hand had been broken. And then... And about the third or fourth round, he got thumbed in his eye and it tore his retina loose. Well, he comes back to the corner then. Now you got a fighter with a broke hand, one eye looking to the ceiling and the other looking over here. But Tiger finished the fight. In the eighth round, they had the fight even. With Tiger fighting from the first round with a broken hand, and from about the third round, I guess it was, Tiger, where he got thumbed in the eye, like I said, one eye is looking to the sea, cockeyed, and, 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 and he finished the fight. And at the eighth round, the fight was even. The last two rounds was, was given to Mullins. I still personally think that Tiger won the fight, but he finished his course. You see, there's a difference between, he could, he could have stopped in the first round. Nobody could have said anything. The man's hand's broken. The hand that he relies to knock people out with is broken. But he... He fought the good fight. He finished the court.
Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.